And now, it's time for Mob Talk Radio with your host, Jeff Canarsi. And welcome back to Mob Talk Radio. And we are going to be talking about Cyrano Salerno again and and sort of going through his paperwork. Uh, But there's a lot of cross-referencing in this to really Tony Salerno. And I want to preface the pages that I'm about to read because, as you know, Salerno was convicted in the commission trial. And the reality is, is that Giuliani and everybody knew that Tony Salerno was not, in fact, the boss of the Genovese crime family. And it would get even more sort of suspect a couple of months later because Vincent the Fish Cafaro ends up becoming a government informant. And he even tells them that Tony Salerno wasn't the boss. Uh, but yet they went after him anyway. And the whole point and the reason why I'm bringing this up is because you're going to find out today who the two sources were that basically told. The government, the Tony Salerno, was the boss of that family. Now, if you're a higher up in the mafia, higher up, right? Vinnie Cafaro uh, was involved with them, and and, and therefore he knew who the real boss was. And he told them it was Vinnie Gigante. But yet there's two other people. One is an FBI agent by the name of Linda Vecchio, and the other was Michael Francis. And so for all of you that continue to spew, he wasn't a rat. You don't know what you're talking about. Once again, we're about to find out how big of a rat Michael Francis really was. You can't make this shit up. All right. Uh, so let's see. This is coming from the judge. In this proceeding, I may and do accept relevant hearsay according to it's appropriate weight under the circumstances. So now you have a federal judge who's saying he's going to allow hearsay. Hearsay only works when you're trying to convict a motherfucker, but it does not work when you're using it as a defense. Uh, I will never understand <coughs> how federal judges on any level can have that sort of discrepancy. You either allow all hearsay or you allow none of it at all. You allow tapes against defendants, but defendants can't use tapes from informants. I just don't understand it. I'm waiting for the day to see a judge that doesn't put up with any of that shit. In light of all of the evidence before me, I accept the averments within this affidavit as credible, except as noted. So the judge is saying he accepts everything that he's heard as credible. Even hearsay. Appendix B, the merits of knowing association charges against Salerno. Salerno does not deny that the evidence before me paints an accurate picture of events. For example, he has not disputed that he was at the Palma Boy Social Club during the government surveillance. Instead, he argues through his attorney that if there had been any wrongdoing, on a part of Mr. Salerno in any of those recorded conversations, he would have been charged with criminal offenses. Those tapes show that he was there with his brother and some of his brother's friends. It absolutely, it has absolutely nothing to do with these proceedings. And that followed, that was on May 14th of 1990, and those were transcripts 14 through 19 to 25. So in other words, he's saying Just because I was there, if I was doing something wrong, you would have indicted me for crimes, and you didn't, and that's a relevant argument, but the judge is going to allow hearsay. Similarly, Salerno does not challenge the investigation's officer's assertion that Anthony Salerno, Vincent Cafaro, 
John Tornalone, Giuseppe Sabato, Louis Gatto, and Sammy Santora are members of organized crime. But you're about to see that that's a little different than what the judge is stating. Regarding Anthony Salerno, the proof of his organized crime involvement is detailed. First, <laughs> DeVecchio identifies Anthony Salerno as the previous boss of the Genovese crime family. Given DeVecchio's expertise in the field of investigation and knowledge of the structure of organized crime in New York, I accept this conclusion as certifiable. But he was wrong because Tony Salerno was not the boss of the Genovese crime family. Unbelievable. Moreover, DeVecchio's conclusion regarding Anthony Salerno was corroborated by many, many, many sources. See the racketeering indictment and convictions of Anthony Salerno, example IO1A-E. The Leonardo transcripts in which he identifies Anthony Salerno as the boss of the Genovese crime family and the Fradiano transcript in which he identifies Anthony Salerno and refers to his role in Cosa Nostra. Evidence, the evidence of Caffaro's organized crime membership is equally compelling. First, we have the DeVecchio statement that Salerno was previously the boss of the family. So wait a minute. If he was previously the boss, how can he be the boss? In addition, Kafaro, a participant in the Government Witness Protection Program, has two separate occasions averred that he was a made member of the Genovese crime family. Uh, given the circumstances under which those were made, I find the Kafaro statements reliable on their face and accept them. So they're going to they're going to pick and choose what they're going to accept. Kafaro told them Tony Salerno <clears throat> was never the boss of the Genovese crime family. Unbelievable. The organized crime ties of Tronalone, Gatto, Santora, and Sabato are proven by several sources. See DeVecchio's affidavit, the permanent subcommittee chart. And basically, they're talking about a hierarchy chart, so that means that that's real, too. And the Leonardo testimony before the sentiment, Senate permanent subcommittee, given DeVecchio's expertise, the corroborating proof where it existed and the fact that the respondent Salerno offered no proof to contradict the conclusions regarding those so named. So I accept the evidence of their underworld ties. So in other words, just because DeVecchio points to a fucking flow chart that they fucking made, they go off of what rats say. How, how, how does, how does Cyrano Salerno or Tony Salerno even combat that? What does he say? I'm not, they're lying. Well, what proof do you have? Well, the same could be said for the government. Well, what proof do you have? Not once was Cyrano Salerno caught on wiretaps talking about illegal shit. Otherwise, they would have charged him. Just like they would have brought more charges against Tony Salerno for those tapes, and they didn't. The remaining issue is whether the investigations officer has sustained his burden of proof that Salerno knowingly associated with these notorious figures Anthony Salerno, Vinnie Cafaro, Tornalone, Gatto, Santoro, and Sabato. July 12th of 1990, the decision in the matter of investigations officer versus Sinise et al. I held that in order for the investigations officer to sustain his burden of proof, a prohibited association with organized crime members, he must show that the contacts in question are purposeful and not incidental or fleeting. Such contacts may be shown in either a business or social context. So in other words, if you're sitting at a table having dinner with a guy, it's got to be organized crime business. <laughs> and determining whether the investigations officer has sustained his burden of proof is a, uh, a prohibited association. The focus will be placed on the nature and not the number of contacts in question. In addition, I held that the absence of direct evidence or knowledge of the organized crime ties of an associate, I conclude that such knowledge may be inferred from the duration and the quality of that association. The proof of respondent Salerno's associations takes two forms. Number one, the testimony of Vincent the Fish Cafaro before the permanent subcommittee and his statement provided to the FBI, and two, the government surveillance tapes. As already noted, Cafaro in his own sworn affidavit to the permanent subcommittee uh, intimated that Cyrano Salerno would make monthly deliveries to Cafaro and Anthony Salerno at the Palma Boy Social Club of shakedown funds from the respondent Salerno's local union dental plan. Also offered were allegations that Cyrano Salerno delivered to Anthony Salerno or Cafaro 
monies that were skimmed from union sweetheart contracts. Since his brother's arrest and conviction, Cyrano Salerno now makes his deliveries to Santora. Given the nature of Cafaro's statements and the circumstances surrounding them, I accept this as fact and I accept it into evidence, just based on hearsay. Uh, Cyrano Salerno's repeated deliveries to organized crime figures of money skimmed from union funds constitutes purposeful associations sufficient to sustain the investigation officer's charges. Additionally, the evidence before me demonstrates that Salerno's associations were full knowing. Anthony Salerno is, after all, respondent Cyrano Salerno's brother in Cofaro and Santora are close associates of Anthony Salerno, with whom the respondent Salerno has numerous contacts. Under all of the circumstances, it may reasonably be concluded that Cyrano Salerno knew of organized crime ties of his brother, Cafaro and Santora, at the time he made those deliveries. At the familial, <clears throat> as to the familial relationship between Cyrano Salerno and Anthony Salerno, it is recognized that certain kinds of highly personal relationships are afforded a substantial measure of sanctuary from unjustified interference. In certain circumstances, a meeting between two brothers would not be subject to criticism. In this case, however, as I have repeatedly noted, uh, Cyrano Salerno's associations with his brother were not solely family business, and the blood relationship between Cyrano and Salerno, Cyrano and Anthony, uh, does nothing to mitigate the evidence before me. While the evidence of the respondents conveying money to Anthony Salerno, Cafaro, and Santora standing alone would establish the investigation officer's charge. I also have before me proof of respondent Salerno's presence in two social clubs frequented by organized crime figures. So once again, it's not a crime to be a member of organized crime. It's not a crime to hang out with people, but they're using social clubs, which are allegedly frequented by gangsters as some sort of e illegality. Uh, and that's what I always have a problem with the government. You say it's not illegal to join the Boy Scouts, but yet you catch me with them and a couple of them are doing bad shit. It must mean that everybody is up to no good. Jimmy Fradiano testified in the United States versus Anthony Salerno that Cyrano Salerno visited the Palma Boy Social Club at least once a week. Testimony from an FBI agent during the same trial corroborated the fact that Cyrano Salerno was a frequent visitor to both the Palma Boy Social Club and Social Club located at 2244 First Avenue, New York. In addition, we have numerous surveillance tapes of the social clubs which capture Cyrano Salerno's presence. So once again, just going to a social club must mean you're breaking all kind of laws, but you have to ask yourself one question. And, and some people may say, well, Jeff, you just playing with words. I'm not. If they did not charge him with crimes based on those social club meetings, then why are you stating in your little dissertation here that it's illegal? And surely you must be doing illegal things if you're there. I'm a member of a social club. Let me tell you something as a fact. 90% of the conversations there have nothing to do with illegality. It's just typical, normal, day-to-day -day shit. Are there fucking meetings? Sure, of course. But still, it's, it's just, it, it's, like, it's like the law says one thing and then the judge just decides, no, nope, we're going to say something else. It's, to me, it's just ridiculous. Uh, most telling among those surveillance tapes is that reflecting the surveillance of the social club located at 2244 First Avenue on February 10th of 1984. The transcript reveals Cyrano Salerno and Cafaro meeting with an official of another union, Moscatello, to discuss union business. This contact with Cafaro was certainly purposeful and was neither incidental nor fleeting. Moreover, given the setting of the meeting and the respondent's past, with his past, here we go. I find that the respondent Salerno knew of Cafaro's organized crime ties at the time of this meeting. And so what? So what? May 14th of 1990 hearing respondents counsel argued the conversation with Moscatello simply addressed the issue of whether or not the union would cover certain workers with insurance. Thus, it was contended that this was not a commission of acts which would in effect come under the position of bringing a reproach to the Teamsters. Now go back and listen to the transcripts that we read. And this defense argument is right on cue with what was said. Go back to last week and listen to the transcripts we read. In making this argument, counsel loses sight of the charge against Salerno. It is in his client's very association with uh, Cafaro on February 10th of 84 that is being challenged. 
The nature of the conversation between Salerno Cafaro and Moscatello is one of relevance that supports finding that the meeting was indeed purposeful. Significant, too, is the result of the surveillance tapes of the Palma Boy Social Club December 4th of 84. That transcript of the surveillance reveals that Cyrano Salerno discusses union business with Anthony Salerno and Cafaro. Again, it is clear that this meeting was indeed purposeful, and the reasons already expressed, I find that Cyrano Salerno was aware of Cafaro's and Anthony Salerno's organized crimes during the meeting. So, if a judge wants to make the argument that here you are running a union, you cannot be associated with criminals, fine. He's busted on that front. There's nothing you can do about it. But once again, we read the transcripts. There was nothing defined uh, that was illegal in those conversations. It can be inferred, and it can be backed up by bullshit hearsay. Uh, the weight to be accorded to the remaining surveillance tapes is less compelling. Cyrano Salerno is only hard, hard heard speaking very briefly of non-substantive matters, and there's no indication of whether or not he remained in the room while Anthony Salerno discussed business with Toronto Gatto and Zabato. So here he is, the judge saying that basically he barely said anything. He didn't really incriminate himself. We don't even know if he was sitting at the table when other conversations went on, because believe me, had they had they said that he would have been charged with a million other fucking things as well. So this is kind of a hypocritical thing. You're making it illegal for him to be in a room, but yet you're saying he had no illegal conversations. Uh, I do note, however, that Salerno's very presence in the Palma Boys Social Club, considering those to those uh, uh, considering those that are known to frequent that club, further supports my finding that Salerno was deliberate and having associations with organized crime, crime members and was deliberate in discussing uh, illegal funds. But he wasn't. So it's like saying guilt by association. That's basically what this is. It's, it's just a very tidy form. In some, I find the investigation officer has carried out his burden of proving that, and there is just cause to find that Cyrano Salerno knowingly associated with members of organized crime, the mafia to wit Anthony Salerno, Vinnie Cafaro, Sammy Santora. The evidence of Salerno's association with Toronto owned Sabato Gatto um, is less compelling and standing on its own perhaps does not support the investigation officer's charge. On the other hand, it's certainly consistent with the determination that Cyrano Salerno knowingly associated with members of organized crime. So fine. Once again, uh, knowing uh, that they were involved in organized crime and hanging out with them. Okay, fine. You can throw them out of the union for that. I get it. I'm not arguing that case. But once again, it's back to the just because other people do stuff makes you just automatically guilty. Uh, let's see the charge regarding Salerno 79 New York state indictment. The second charge against Cyrano Salerno rests on an allegation that he brought reproach upon the IBT by virtue of his conviction involving a specific prohibited financial interest and a transaction in violation of the New York labor law 725 for receiving $500 on September 13th to 78, $500 on December 14th to 78 from an employer of IBT local 272. Salerno was an officer in 272 during the time at uh, the above mentioned. Judgment of conviction and a sentence of one year probation was entered July 10th of 79. The investigation officer and respondent Salerno stipulated that articles about Salerno's conviction appeared in newspapers in and around New York City. It was also stipulated that since his conviction, Salerno was reelected to his union office in 81, 84, and 87. So the union didn't have a fucking problem with it. These stipulations are relevant and that Salerno argues that this second charge is barred by Article 21, Section 3D of the IBT Constitution. Section 3D reads as follows. Charges against elected officers of the International Union or any subordinate body shall be limited only to those activities or actions occurring during their current term of office and only those activities and actions occurring prior to their current term which were not then known generally by the membership of the International Union or the subordinate body in case of an officer of a subordinate body. In this post-hearing submission, Salerno argues that conviction was generally known to the membership prior to his present term of office and that he was reelected after these facts were known. And by all union uh, rules, uh, that he did the right thing. 
He had already been convicted prior. He was voted in after they already knew about it. So where's the illegality in that? Salerno supports his conclusion. Uh, number one, that the newspaper coverage of Salerno's conviction would have been known to all. And the fact that Salerno was barred from holding union office for a period of two years as a result of that conviction was known. The investigations officer, while acknowledging the press coverage in Salerno's two year ban from office, he argues that Salerno has failed to prove that his criminal conduct was generally known to the members of Local 272 in any election after his conviction. Let me argue that. If he's a gangster, everybody knows it. If he's a gangster, everybody knows what he does. He's the head of that fucking union. You think they don't know? That's just the most absurd shit I've ever seen in my life. Investigations officer post hearing memorandum at seven. And you do know who the investigations officer is, right? Linda Vecchio. In an earlier uh, disciplinary proceeding, I determined that two respondents could not avail of themselves Section 3D defense, even though they were elected to office following criminal convictions. In that case, I found that since those respondents were vigorously challenging their convictions at the appellate level and continuing to deny their criminal charges, their activities and actions could not be general and known to the union membership. Bullshit. It's bullshit. He's making an argument that... that um, He's not allowing them to use this defense, which by looking at the bylaws, I just told you what he did was legal. They knew about it. It was in the newspapers. They were informed of the convictions, but he is not allowing Cyrano Salerno to use this defense because he says just because they were appealing their convictions and they were denying certain criminal charges that it wouldn't have been known to membership who elected him. Are you fucking kidding me? This is the shit that federal judges do. Uh, let's see. Investigations officer versus Friedman, September 29th of 89, opinion of independent administrator, uh, blah, 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 blah. Similarly, in this case, a review of Salerno's judgment or conviction reveals that Salerno's conviction came after trial. Thus, it's assumed that Salerno contested the charges against him and inserted his innocence at trial. There is absolutely not a single thing standing before me to suggest that Salerno ever changed his position. That is, he readily admitted his guilt. So if he readily admitted his guilt, what do you see why this is so confusing when you read it? This is why indictments are so important. This is why court paperwork is so fucking important because now you can see the fucking hypocrisy of what they say. Uh, Let's see. Okay, it doesn't matter. We don't need a fucking opinion. Hold on a second. Okay, now we're going to get to the funny shit. Uh, the relevant... Okay. Um, let me see here. Salerno failed to carry his section defense 3D uh, period of the story. Not a single witness or document was produced to support Salerno's argument that the membership of his local knew what was of the activities underlying in his conviction the day that they reelected him to office. So in other words, if I don't bring six people forward that said, yeah, he told us, you think they're going to fucking do that? No, because then the government's going to go after the union. The simple fact that Salerno's conviction was reported in the press and that he was barred from office for two years does not satisfy the three D defense. No proof was offered as to what, if anything, the membership knew of Salerno's local was told regarding those activities underlying his conviction and subsequent uh, absence from office. Indeed, there was not any evidence introduced to the extent which the membership which reelected him recalled or even read in the newspaper accounts in question. So in other words, you didn't bring five people that said, yeah, we saw the articles, we knew. I, it's just so stupid. Because by the bylaws, he did the right thing. He left office for two years. I find the investigation officer has established just cause in finding Salerno culpable as charged with respect to the 1979 criminal conviction. The investigation officer's evidence against Bill Cotolo, as noted at the onset, Cotolo is charged with both knowingly associating with members of Cosa Nostra, including Greg Scarpa Sr., Gregory Scarpa Jr., as well as being a made member of La Cosa Nostra, as well as having got dialogue with Cyrano Salerno and Anthony Salerno. Given that I find sufficient proof of Cotolo's membership in organized crime, but I find in, insufficient evidence of any actual association with the Scarpas or others. You, you gotta be kidding me. You know why this is, right? Because who is Greg Scarpa's fucking handler? 
Linda Vecchio. And of course, DeVecchio tells them that. But there's something even more. <laughs> the investigation officer proof will be discussed first in the context of associating with allegations and the second in the context of the membership charge. As with Salerno, the investigation officer's chief evidence against Cutolo was the DeVecchio affidavit. We are told by DeVecchio that Bill Cutolo, who is also known as Billy Fingus, is known by DeVecchio to have been president of the IBT Local 861. According to the Federal Bureau of Investigation, Billy Cotolo is known to be an, an inf inf extremely influential maiden member of the Colombo crime family. Information available to DeVecchio indicates that Cotolo knowingly associated with other maid members of the mafia. DeVecchio also cites to a mafia chart attached to his affidavit, Exhibit BB, entitled Colombo Hierarchy 1980 fucking 7. This chart identifies Cutolo as a capo within the Colombo organized crime family. Lastly, DeVecchio references a chart listing members of the Colombo family dated April 8th of 88, which was prepared by the Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations of the United States Senate and identified Cutolo as a member of the Colombo crime family. Obviously, we know Greg Scarpa told them that. Okay. All right. Uh, here we go. This is this is the fucking thing. Exhibit I zero dash one GG is a signed, documented statement and affidavit of Michael Francis given to the FBI on May first, nineteen ninety. In this statement, Francis admits to being a member of the Colombo crime family since nineteen seventy five. This is consistent with Francis's testimony given during a 1988 federal criminal trial. Remember how everybody says he never testified against anybody? Ooh, big shock. Yes, he fucking did. This is consistent with Francis's testimony given during an 88 federal criminal trial in which he describes himself as a member of the Colombo crime family. In addition, Michael Francis identified Tony Salerno, Bill Cotolo, Cyrano Salerno, Vincent Cafaro, and many others, including Greg Scarpa Sr. and Jr. as members of the Colombo crime family, members of the Genovese crime family, gave us names, ranks, and dates. Hello? <laughs> Unbelievable. While DeVecchio states that information available to him indicates that Cotolo knowingly associated with other made members of the mafia, it doesn't disclose that information he relied upon in making that statement. Uh, excuse me, let me read this. While DeVecchio states that the information available to him indicates that Cutolo knowingly associated with other made members of the mafia, he refuses to disclose that, or he refuses to disclose what information he re replied upon in making this statement and statements about others. Nor does he want to indicate whether the information in question is a type of relied upon uh, information known by the FBI. So he's refusing to out his source. So if you refuse to out your source and you refuse to say this information was provided to me by Gregory Scarpa, then all you're saying is hearsay. This is how the FBI does shit. This is what the FBI uh, and judges allow to go on. So let's see, where are we? Uh, okay, thus I assign uh, weight to DeVecchio's statements. Even, even the Francis statement that Cotolo was, that Cotolo and the Scarpas and the Salernos were all members of, the, of an organized crime family probably does not advance the investigation officer's proof in that regard. Francis uh, stated that Cutolo, to his knowledge, never associated with the Scarpas. And that's bullshit because we know they did. Uh, I also afford, uh, I also accord a lot of weight to the chart entitled Colombo Hierarchy, since I am given uh, much information as to the genesis of the chart, I just have to accept and I have to accord weight to the chart prepared by the subcommittee, given the nature of the chart. So on one second, he's saying, well, you know, it's just a chart. We don't really have proof, but because they said so, I'm going to take it. So 
Uh, turning to the evidence of Cotolo's membership in the mafia, DeVecchio's statement that, according to the Federal Bureau of Investigation, Cotolo is known to be an extremely influential member of the family does warrant credence. I have accepted DeVecchio as an expert, truthful, and knowledgeable in the investigation structure of organized crime in New York. It follows then that DeVecchio's statement concerning the FBI's classification of Cotolo as an organized crime member is reliable. This is in contrast to DeVecchio's statement regarding Cotolo's association with other made members of the mafia. The source of DeVecchio's knowledge underlying that statement he has refused to disclose. In addition, unlike the statement regarding Cotolo's association, the statement of Cotolo's membership is corroborated by the Senate per, uh, subcommittee chart. <laughs> in combination with Francisi's direct trust testimony that Cotolo is a member of the same family. Unbelievable. Unfucking believable. Because the subcommittee puts together a chart and I can go back to another page where he just said it didn't. Just because they put together a chart makes it so. Because Michael Francis said so, it is so. I conclude the investigation officer has 100% carried the burden of proof establishing just cause to find that Cotola was a member of organized crime. While a determination of membership in organized crime logically leads to the inference that Cotola knowingly associated with members of the mafia, even absent proof of much, much association, I don't really have to reach that issue, given my finding that Cotolo is affiliated with organized crime. So in other words, he's saying, even though we don't really have any evidence to suggest that, uh, that would show that he's a member of organized crime, he is, because I think so. That's what it just said. Cyrano Salerno's association with members of organized crime and Cotolo's membership of organized crime are gross anomalies in the union dedicated to riddling its ranks of corrupt influences. Thus, I find that the only just penalty for Salerno and Cotolo is permanent disbarment from those union. As for the penalty to be imposed in the charge of arising out of Salerno's criminal conviction, I find that given the serious nature of that conviction, unlawful financial ties to an employer, permanent disbarment from the IBT is in order. Any mitigation of this penalty may have been warranted given the age and the conviction of the two years bar from office already suffered is lost when Salerno's conviction is judged against the backdrop of his serious underworld ties. In accordance with the above determinations, Salerno and Cotolo are permanently are to remove themselves from their IBT affiliated unions, including membership of their local unions in the International Brotherhood of Teamsters, and they are uh, they are to draw no money or compensation therefrom from any IBT affiliated source. Uh, let me look. Oh, respondent Salerno and Cotolo warrant not only their removal from the IBT, but also termination of all benefits. And it's clear that I lack the authority to terminate the respondent's pension payments. Uh, so there you go. There you go. And that's. Uh, that's sort of how it goes. That's what the FBI does. You see the hypocrisy now? And so a lot of people, you know, constantly say to me, oh, you defend these fucking guys. If they weren't doing bad shit. Listen, I defend them based on the laws. I'm not playing Jesus Christ here. I'm not playing uh, Gabriel, the angel, the archangel. I I'm not doing that. I'm simply saying by the laws that you institute, the laws that are put on paper, the laws that Congress votes to put into place, society puts into place, if you are to be judged by those laws, stick to the fucking law. And they don't. And it's like I always say, this is why guys plead out. People say to me all the time, ah, well, if they didn't do nothing, they wouldn't plead out. Really? You just saw a tapestry of bullshit weaved in 25 different pages. Say one thing, do another. Say one thing, do another. A guy hands a guy money in a bar, mentions another guy's name. Now it's an extortion charge. It's bullshit. This is how the government operates. And you're about to find out when we start talking about the closing of the Kennedys, how they really fucking operate. But that's my point. Uh, I'm not playing uh, the moral justice guy here. People do bad shit. That's, that's just the fucking God's honest truth. But if you're going to go by the letter, 
You're going to go by the code. You're going to go by the law. If you're going to allow fucking hearsay, then it needs to be allowed on every side. Jimmy Calandra, fifth-hand information, got Anthony Spiro put in jail the rest of his fucking life. Why is that allowed? Why is it that the FBI can play me play tapes of me shitting and pissing in the bathroom talking about an old murder? And maybe I'm making it up to make the guy next to me laugh. Maybe he can't shit. Maybe if I make him laugh, he, his belly moves and he releases the golden nugget in the toilet. Maybe that's why I'm doing it. But yet the rat in the case who's taping the goddamn thing. Nah, we're not going to play any of his fucking tapes. Because tapes, regardless, tapes always seem to work to get you convicted. But they never work to get you acquitted. In the case of J.R. Rubio. He admitted shaking the FBI down. He admitted milking the trial and inventing shit to get as much money from a book deal as he could. How is that not fucking relevant in a case? Doesn't that show you the character of somebody and why they do something? I hope Joey Merlino gets 5,000 years. Fuck him. I'd have never been in this position if it wasn't for him. No, asshole. You got caught selling drugs and then decided to become a rat. That's how that happened, but you're not honest about that. And we've talked about him, but this is just a case of thousands. And nobody's saying that a mob guy is the most innocent guy. And oh, poor him. Nobody's fucking saying that. But you should be convicted.